Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this December 7th, 2020 Brattleboro Democracy Forum, a reconception of democracy with Tim Kipp and friends. Wow. I haven't, <laughs> I just love those words, Brattleboro Democracy Forum. I love the words democracy forum, a place where people get together just to talk about democracy. And now it's on Zoom. My name is Woody. I'm host of this forum. We are recording the meeting. Please keep yourself muted until you want to speak and then mute yourself when you're done speaking. The mute button is on the lower left of your screen, a little microphone symbol. Also, please say your name and where you live before you speak and every time you speak. This will help us with our audio recording. For the sake of our radio audience, <clears throat> I will introduce our participants. Tim Kipp is a retired history and political science teacher of 39 years and a political activist since the 1960s. Stephen Van Noy is a PhD and practicing psychologist in Brattleboro and a socially engaged citizen. Nick Biddle is a retired professor of Latin American history and a Brattleboro resident since 2013. Dr. Mary Gannon has been involved with social justice and education and activism personally and professionally throughout Northern New England for over 30 years. Mary lives in Winchester, New Hampshire. Neil Sr., MD, is a child and adolescent psychiatry specialist in Brattleboro, Vermont, and has been practicing for 50 years. And I'm Woody Bernhard, Marlboro resident, retired carpenter, and director of We Celebrate Democracy, Civil Rights for All. And I am, of course, your host tonight. I'm pleased to welcome Tim Kipp, who will lead our Reconception of Democracy discussion tonight. Tim will get help from Mary, Stephen, Nick, Neil, and all of you when the discussion opens up. Tim, I will now turn it over to you. Tell us about your presentation. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are attending the meeting. Tim, take it away. Thanks, Woody. Um, December 7th, 1941, the United States democracy was assaulted. Well, I think we're still in some forms of assault today. Uh, for 50 years anyway, democracy has been eroding in this country. The disappearance of a middle class, the acceleration of class, caste, race inequalities, a new precariat class, climate degradation, shrinking political rights, corporate control of the political economy, the privatization of the public sphere. The list is familiar to all of those who are paying attention. In the last four years, this erosion has accelerated into a full assault, <clears throat> excuse me, assault on democracy under the Republicans and Trump regime. That's the bad news. The good news is that amid, amid this collapse, a resistance has emerged, catalyzed into action to change this country's course. Arguably, this is one of the largest, broadest coalitions of citizen actions for democracy in US history. From the streets, the courts, and the halls of Congress, democracy's defenders have mobilized. Trumpian republicanism, will not disappear without a long-term struggle of resistance and the building of new structures. Now is the time to re-envision democracy. In 1944, Roosevelt called for a second Bill of Rights. As he said, the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, quote, proved inadequate to secure equality, unquote. And that was in his uh, State of the Union address of 1944. What Roosevelt wanted was basically an economic bill of rights that would ensure employment, education, housing, health care, social security for all people. None of these characteristics were ever specifically embodied in our founding documents. The founders left us to thrash it out over these many years. In these times of crisis, 
we have an opportunity to expand the vision and potential of real democracy. And this democracy forum discussion is part of that fight. So that's my introduction. And what I'd like to do is read the, it's not a very long article that I had recently published um, about what I define as real democracy. And I thought hopefully this will be a springboard for uh, discussion. And so uh, let, me, let me just read this. The United States is in a crisis of two nations, economic calamity, racial reckoning, a widening pandemic, and rising authoritarian, and authoritarianism divide Americans by a gulf not experienced since the Civil War. Our future may well be charted by how we conceptualize democracy itself. Understanding, expanding, and sustaining democracy can perhaps lead to a bridging of this Grand Canyon of national divide. Writing in the early 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, <clears throat> excuse me, in his Democracy in America, observed that only, quote, the surface of American society is covered with a layer of democratic paint unquote. Perhaps a more expansive and inclusive definition that challenges the orthodoxy will lead to a more comprehensive understanding of what a, what truly, a truly democratic society can be. This definition demands higher standards for the roles of government and a more active citizenry. Democracy is not just voting and lawmaking. It's not just political. Real democracy happens in the legislative bodies and the voting booths and the economic lives of us all. Real democracy recognizes that where you find political power, you will also find economic power and vice versa. Economic power is essential to democracy because our economic lives actually supersede our political lives. Real democracy is the equal access for all people to the power that influences our economic and political lives. All people in, in every aspect, the gender, class, sexual orientation, color, etc. Real democracy happens at work when workers have a fair share of the fruits of their labors and control over the work process. Real democracy recognizes that private property does not give license to exploit workers for higher profits. Real democracy does not conflate democracy with capitalism. It does not confuse a meaningless abundance of material goods with freedom. Real democracy enables all people fair access to the security of housing, employment, health, education, and leisure. Real democracy happens when there is no poverty, hunger, racial, and you know, class inequality. Yes, this type of democracy is a continuum and never-ending process that might be, must be perpetually defended and nurtured. The forces that threaten democracy are constantly at work. They are embodied in the nature and the process of our economic system. These threats can come not only from corrupt and greedy people, but from the political and economic institutions themselves. Structural weaknesses can determine, can, excuse me, can undermine democracy, regardless of whether the leaders are good or bad. Real democracy recognizes the fundamental threats of the systems of privilege. Those privileges are white, caste and class, and I would define them also as corporate privilege. Real democracy promotes a true multi-party system that represents a broad spectrum of citizens' interests. Real democracy requires full accountability of those in power. Real democracy supports a comprehensive public, ed public education system that advances critical thinking, and media literacy to distinguish facts from propaganda. Real democracy is perpetually evolving, is a perpetually evolving system where the people have relatively equal access to economic and political power. Karl Marx, Santa Claus, Hey, we can bridge this 
countries divide with more democracy. Real democracy is like good organic Vermont manure. It only works when you spread it around. <laughs> so, now, if we could uh, go into a discussion. So, Tim, um, do you want to pose a single question to start conversation? Um, oh, yes. Okay. Let me let me start it this way. Thanks, Nick. Um, we have such a, in my view, a very truncated view of what democracy is, and I think it played out uh, all too well in in our struggles since the election in uh, early November. Um, and that is the, uh, so yes, uh, we seem to have overcome to a certain extent the, uh, the uh, anticipated uh, dangers or pitfalls of, of, the, uh, of the election, uh, but I, I have questions about that as well. But anyway, um, I believe that we have been taught that democracy is voting. And is fundamentally that is what democracy is, and they are extolling the virtues of oh, the sacred right of voting. Absolutely, it's important. But if that's if that's is are really the lens that we're looking at it through, I think it's too narrow. I think it's too exclusive, and I think um, it doesn't raise our expectations of what a good society should be about, or what the good a good role of government should be. So. If that's if that helps, I'll I'll pitch in right here um, if I might. This is Nick. Uh, I uh, I come at the question of democracy as a historian of the United States and 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 note that the United States has from its inception had two fundamental principles. The first is the protection of property. That's the absolute goal of government. It has been all the way through the Constitutional Convention, right through Citizens United, right to the corporate privilege that Tim is referring to that we're all way too aware of. The protection of property and those who make property, and that is to say wealth, is the absolute primary goal of this republic. It's not a democracy. It never was. It was never supposed to be. It's a republic. The founders were interested in creating a new kind of world, and they did. And while they wanted to protect their property, and they did, the newness of their world is the second principle that they upheld. And it is this that men cannot be justly bound by laws in the making of which they have no part. So the trick for the founding fathers and for all people in power right up to Charles Koch today is to create the semblance of, of, of being part of making the laws which is what voting, and this is you know, the sacredness of voting in a presidential election, at least that is, starting, is defended by Republican governors. But that's it. And that's, you know, that's, I completely concur with Tim. If that, that, that tends to be America's understanding of democracy. And, and it's, it's absolutely a, a kernel, just a little crumb of what actual democracy can and has looked like at various moments in time. Uh, and so what we face consistently and constantly is a system that wants to eviscerate democratic participation right to the edge of where we will stop being bound by the laws. But so long as we can go on as a society through all the different manipulations that, that, that somehow or other persuade us that we are justly bound by laws because somehow or other by voting for Biden instead of Trump, I am participating in the creation of the laws. That's where we're at. So the expansion of democracy from today forward is the expansion of standing on, you know, three inches and, and the whole world ahead of us. 
I want to say two things. One is Maury Holmes is the husband of my cousin in, te in Victoria, Australia. And I just want to recognize him and welcome him to this forum. Nice. I'm glad we have an international presence. That's so great. Finally, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, so the second thing I want to say is I have been thinking a lot about hierarchies. And essentially what democracy requires or expects is peons at the bottom vote for somebody. And it goes up through the the structure so that at the end of the day, there is essentially, uh, at least in the political process, one person representing us, or he's representing 52% of the country. The, currently it's Biden. But the reality is there's eight people representing us, which is the Supreme Court. But it, it feels to me like, and having had the experience of trying to con uh, uh, contact my uh, Somebody's hacked us. Should everyone close out? But I want to say to Tim that that list that you had, Tim, was extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I was profoundly affected by it. I thought it was a really wonderful review of this ideal of democracy. Mm -hmm. Having said that, and I, and I don't want to, nothing I'm going to say is denigrating what you said. But I'm really concerned about the fundamental concept of democracy, because democracy implies to me each individual is represented at the highest level. And the trouble I have with that is we have a hierarchy. And I can tell you on a local level in a state where there's only 500,000 people, any attempt that I make to talk to, to email um, Welsh, or Sanders or Leahy, they're not, they never respond. And if I'm having trouble, I can only imagine what it's like for 37 million people in California. And the question becomes, as we build these hierarchies of power, which is what we've got, then how do we, at the bottom of the pile, get represented at, in terms of our views, especially in a two-party system where You've got, you're into a forced choice about issues where, as we all understand, three of the issues I might agree with and seven I might not. So do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, how do we, what's going to make a difference in terms of having representative democracy? I, I think we probably all have some responses. Let me make a quick one, because this is really, I think we have to be more pragmatic or practical about it. Um, I, I didn't bring a magic wand when I was, I didn't write my democracy piece with a magic wand and knowing that it's, that it's an ideal type. And I know that um, everyone here, everyone in our meeting understands that. Um, but it was a, a focal point, as, as you pointed out, Neil, to, you know, get a discussion going. Um, if I was to take one practical step, or which I think is a doable step, is that we have to um, we have to democratize representation. In other words, more people uh, um, in Congress that rep reflect the color, the gender, and so forth of the population. And one, I think, a very practical first step, which is a very huge one, <clears throat> excuse me, is campaign finance. If we can tackle campaign finance and go after Citizens United and the McCutcheon case and the Buckley versus Vallejo cases, um, I think you're, you've started, started a process of getting more equal representation, more real representation that then laws could reflect um, more of what, well, even in your own, your own country, your home country of Australia, I, I dare say is a much more democratic than what we have here. Or if you look at the social democratic states in Europe, their, their congresses, their voter participation rates, um, and their laws reflect a broader spectrum of needs of society. And so, so how do you do that? And I, I don't want to be facile about it, but by, by getting, cutting through this idea of campaign finance, where it's the wealthy, are the ones that have the voice and the rest of us are just they're just just shouting into the wind so it feels to me one of the issues that i have with this 
D word in this country, not wanting to get hacked, is that <laughs> we're on a 365 day a year continuous election process where apparently 40% of the time for the representatives is spent raising money. And the question is, which is not true in a parliamentary system. And it, it's basically taking over. It runs everything that happens, I think. I, I, I speak to what you're saying. I'm agreeing with you. But and ultimately, um, is there, do you have any thoughts about how to get this process limited to a six week process that happens in Australia, New Zealand, England, instead of a, for a continuous process from the, you know, from I now? Think, I think they're linked. I think they're linked in terms of campaign finance because the argument is that speech, <clears throat> money is speech. And yeah. so you say, so if you keep the same paradigm of, of money and speech, then you can't limit campaign finance. You can't campaign yeah, at true. all. Yeah, uh, I mean, Canada has a two month, and, and England, I think, has th about three months as, right. as a general right. rule for a campaign. And right. they have, they have, you can't spend more in England than $30,000 equivalent dollars right. on a campaign. That's true in Australia as well. Yeah. I was saying, Jim, um, campaign finance reform, I was very involved in it highly with Granny D back in the 02, 03, we got the McCain-Feingold Act and, 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 and it, it looked like a campaign finance reform that was going to have substance until the Supreme Court came around and gutted it. And Citizens United is the ultimate gut of that. Very much like the 13th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution and then Jim Crow, et cetera, et cetera. We have these historical examples. Uh, I, I, I wonder at this moment in time, we don't have a lot of time in terms of humanity's, you know, march to the cliff as in lemmings. Um, we, I feel like, you know, that's what I love about the Green New Deal. I think it, it brings everything together. I think it brings the ideals that you are referring to, Tim, in your, in your article in one place. And it also speaks to the, what I agree is the most cataclysmic uh, danger that confronts us. Um, and so while campaign finance is at the top of my list was way back in 96 when the Alliance for Democracy got started and, and et cetera, et cetera, and then it happens and then boom. It, we don't have time for too many more social movements is my point. And if we had a Supreme Court that was reflective of society, then we wouldn't have this, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. You know, so, I mean, there are many avenues to steps towards, you know, there are avenues into this problem. And so campaign finance or restructuring the Supreme Court or what have you are just two avenues. And I agree, you know, how much more time do we have? Yeah, I mean, with the backdrop of climate degradation. I think one of the things, um, the climate degradation, what's happening with the COVID pandemic, they could be really equated in the young youth's mind because their youth are experiencing their minds this like, they're so isolated. They're like, it's all this trauma, you know, they're very, you know, they're a group of people who, um, you know, ha tend to be a little more self-focused and, and, and at this moment, they're, they're devastated by what's happened with the COVID and um, Neil's seeing it in his psychiatry practice and so forth, um, ostensibly. And I think it'd be a time for us as um, people who want to change um, things to, to try to get this, the, the young people to connect the two because what's gonna happen with climate change is exactly the kind of thing that's happening with COVID right now. It's going to be catastrophic. COVID's catastrophic. It's going to get worse, and climate change is good. It's catastrophic. It's going to get worse, and it's a chance for us to reach out and and say, hey, if you don't like this, this the you know, if you don't like COVID, you're not going to like what's going to happen with climate change.
other comments, observations? The um, certainly we have to uh, put stock in the next generations. I'm, I'm less optimistic that that can sustain itself, given the the history of that. And and if you look at youth vote, even in this last election, it still was lower. It, I mean, it's it's it was better, but it was it's still not where it should be. The 18 to 26 year olds. Sam, even if you don't focus on the youth, I think this is something anybody of any generation could really relate to right now. Yes, yes. If people don't like the effects of COVID-19, you know, what's happening, there, this is going to be equivalent with climate change. I think it's a way of, of so-called marketing. I mean, but, it, but it's a really important thing to market um, to change the future of this globe and our, our children and our grand, you know, grandchildren, whatever. I think it's profoundly important. Tim, do you have any thoughts about why parliamentary systems appear to have a higher voter turnout than the the republic system that we have yes i do but I'd, I'd love to hear some other voices in that i mean i definitely do but other voices i would allow that and if if not then i will speak but yeah <clears throat> nick well you know thinking about why parliaments are are more uh gather more popular participation is not something I actually have that much to say about. Um, okay, can we write that down? <clears throat> that this is some topic that you don't have anything to say about? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let I, me jump, let me jump. Okay, because I can, I can respond if you want, but. Okay, so this is my two cents and I'd like you to rebut it or support it. I think one of the things about a parliamentary system is there's multiple parties. Yes. And people can get this. You can always find a niche in a multiple party system, electoral system, that is impossible to find in a two party system. Yep. Yep. So and I think yeah. Go ahead. You no, go ahead. I thought you were done. Oh, well, I, I would be, but I can't stop myself. And then the other thing is that the process is a tenure. Is, is shortened. You don't get the exhaustion. You don't get the thousands of freaking ads on, on television. It's all done within four to six weeks. And so there's this, it comes to a peak very quickly. And it strikes me that I don't, you know, what I, I don't have television, but what I hear from other people is they're overwhelmed but with political ads for months after months after months. And, and it just like buries people. And then the third thing is, in terms, at least in terms of Australia, and I can't speak to any other parliamentary system, or there's two other things. One is that the prime minister is elected by the party. And so if there's misbehavior by the parliament, by the, by the prime minister, they're removed by the party in, or the coalition in power, as opposed to this system, where this, these people seem to be, they're in for the four years because um, the process to remove them mm -hmm. is forever. There's no- I, I, I agree with what uh, all of the, what you have just said. Um, and let me amplify a little bit <clears throat> that the, the uh, candidates run as party members. The parties have articulated positions. So you're really, in many ways, you're not, run, you're not voting for the person, you're voting for a party that actually stands for something. We don't have political parties that stand for anything. Yeah, and if they do, they morph, you know, there, there, is, there is, they stand for whichever way the wind is blowing. Yeah. And, and you have that, plus you have the cult of personalities. Right. Um, and those are, that's how people vote in this country. Right. If you if you um, eliminated that and voted for positions, you wouldn't you'd know. Okay, the Labour Party um, has this position. The Conservative Party, the Christian Right, has this position, and you don't have to go through you know two years to convince people because you already know what the goddamn positions are of the parties. Right. right. And therefore, it simplifies, it clarifies, and it moves it on. Right. 
I, I think part of the problem is uh, that I think the education system in the United States is indicted here because I find that the level of knowledge, interest, and uh, social uh, you know, involvement is just incredibly low. And I feel that that partially comes from uh, our educational system. And the idea that 74 million people voted for Trump you know, is just sort of breathtaking to me in how yeah. uneducated people are. If you, and if you couldn't see, I was nodding my head. I, I, I did see that, and I appreciated it. <laughs> but, but, I wasn't nodding off. I was nodding my head. But Andy, can I say something? Yeah. Having grown, grown up in Australia, having gone to school most of the time, you know, where, where I showed up and didn't, you know, play hooky, there was not a single class on civics or politics for the first 12 years of my education. None. Zero. But, but we did you learn? Did we you didn't learn about politics in the school. We didn't. Have, we, nor did we have sex ed for what it's for what it's worth. But you know, essentially, that was not what was that. That's how we didn't get that from there at all. So what made you vote was the fine if you didn't. Yeah, vote. it was a ten dollar vote, ten pound vote if you didn't fine. If you didn't. Fine. What's, what's, the, what's the participation rate in Australia on average? Plus ninety <laughs> percent. And we're we're jumping up and down because we have close to sixty seven percent, which is the highest in a hundred and about over a hundred years, one hundred and twenty. So ultimately, what it gets down to is you train kids from the beginning; they're going to be fined if they don't vote, and they develop and, mm. and then make it a short election process. So I, I, I think it has to do with what you have to be motivated to vote, and the way you get motivated to vote is you actually stand for something to vote for. You know, and there, there's well, whole mythology well, of, well, there's uh, people are apathetic in this country. I don't think they're apathetic. They're alienated. There's right, a fundamental right. difference. Yeah, but I would also say in this country, if, we, if you look what's happened since the election, we've all been denigrated because of our participation in an electoral process that is uh, fake. Right. Essentially, the terrible. message is this is not a real election. What you know from the highest powers, essentially, we're being told that everything is fake, the wrong person got elected. Right. The consequences of that are going to be appalling. Mm -hmm. I've never heard such a story elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is it's not just immediate about this T bird or whatever his name is, but it's it's got the, the trickle down from that is going to be unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I'd like to follow up on uh, Andy's uh, comment about education. It's, it seems to me that that we're really uh, we've really neglected democracy in our culture, and part of that is in our education system, <clears throat> but it's also in in this in the the idea of uh, <clears throat> our laws uh, over the over the years, many years, we have let uh, a lot of people get away with breaking the law, and we have not held them to account. And why that happens, I don't know. But you can't keep a democracy if you can't enforce the laws that protect democracy. For instance, after the Civil War. It was all this stuff about reconstruction, but it was put to rest by people break, basically breaking the law and uh, taking advantage of the black population in the South, even though it was against the law. And to me, that was one of the first things that put an end to our democracy. Mm -hmm. That if you have people breaking a law and being allowed to break the law, there isn't any hope. And we still have a lot of people breaking the law and getting away with it. And uh, that's a serious problem. I love the history of prohibition for that exact reason. It's the exact moment in which the president on down and actually the property, the white people, the Bushes, the Kennedys, they all, they all actually participated, brought liquor down you know, uh, from Canada. Both of those families did and, and really profited 
of mm. breaking the law. And, and a system that did that for a decade, that's America. It's about money. It's not about yeah. democracy. It's not yeah. about the law. And I think the lawbreakers are the ones that are in power. They're the most dangerous lawbreakers, for sure, yep. because of their, their, their wield, the economic power they wield and their political power. And, the, uh, and they, they do it dripping, dripping with righteousness. It's a great cover. You know? Yeah. So, so uh, folks, I, I want to I bring us out of the clouds a little bit. Not that that's a bad thing. Not that being in the clouds, and I mean, when I say in the clouds, meaning just sort of this theoretical conversation that we're having, because I've been thinking a lot about what all of this means for me in my practice as a, somebody who is a consultant, a teacher, a community organizer, um, a coach. I'm, I spend a lot of time every day just talking to people on the phone zooming with people who are struggling about what are the strategies what are the skill sets that people need to navigate all of the things that we're talking about um i mean i had three of those conversations today and it's mostly with white people it's mostly with people with people my conversations are mostly with people with privilege and um you know, that's kind of where I have to be right now. Now, part of it is to preserve my sanity because of this dehumanizing pandemic that we're in, where I don't get to spend time with all of you and other folks, you know, just reflecting and chewing on all of this, that we have to do it in this kind of a setting where we have to worry about whether, you know, we're going to get Zoom bombed or feel, you know, uncomfortable about what's happening. So, I have been listening to a couple of different podcasts and one that I know that I shared on, I think with Nick and, and Tim over the weekend, um, I'm thinking a lot about this idea of cancel culture and how in, and so I think about this because I want to talk about practice and skill sets. And I think about how when I'm in some situations even in my community, and certainly through the election, when Winchester, you know, went for is moving more, more and more red than it has been. Cheshire County over here is moving more purple than it's been in a while. To really try and understand who's in my community and why are they making the choices that they're making, and a lot of it is as a lot of you have talked about, it's lack of education, it's lack of a deeper understanding of history, it's a, um, of our political economy, people aren't educated, the schools have failed us deeply. Um, but I also, I'm feeling sort of like, I spend a lot of time wringing my hands and trying to think about how, what my next steps are, because the truth is, so for example, let me, it's better if I give you an example. I was in a training last week um, where I was with a predominant, num predominant number of women, white women over 50, which would include me. Um, so let's say over 55. And <laughs> a lot of these women in this training was a human resource organization, and they were convinced that they had no reason, there was no reason for them to talk about racial equity or racial justice or white supremacy culture. They, didn't, they couldn't understand for the life of them why they had to be there, why it mattered to them, what value the conversation would have. And so I had to really sit with what, what they were saying and understand from their, where they're situated um, in their particular worldview, rural Vermont, this is Lamoille County, has some of the highest rates of COVID right now has some of the highest rates of poverty in the state and they are working for barely a, a living wage. And so what I realized is when I'm talking about specifically and those of you who know what I do around racial justice, when I'm, when I'm in communities where folks are already feeling impoverished, where they don't feel heard, they don't feel like they have a voice, I can't start talking to them about racial equity. What I want to talk to them about is how the systems that we're in are dehumanizing all of us. 
and that the systems that we're in, whether we have privilege, white privilege, gender privilege, you know, I'm getting a little tired of that language because I feel like it's not working anymore. That we have to understand that all of these systems of capitalism, of fascism, of, um, of misogyny, which is what we just witnessed about a half an hour ago, are, are all impacting each of us, no matter where we sit in the conversation. And I'm just feeling, I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making a, uh, I'm making a point, maybe I'm not even asking a question, but I'm trying to think about the path forward because the path forward for me has to be, if I can spend some time trying to understand where somebody's lived experience is in the moment that I'm engaging with them and try to figure out how to meet them somewhere, all of what we're talking about is not really going to matter for most of these folks. This is my world. It's not really going to matter for them. And I have to figure out where I can meet them in their own sense of their lack of their dehumanizing experience that they've had. And to also figure out what is the path forward. And then I can play my game of my tricks up my sleeve with my training and all of that. But to just meet people where they are and understand that we all have been impacted by this. And even I have to say, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of stuff about the Trump voter and the profiles of the Trump voter. And, you know, some of those folks are definitely white supremacists, white power. They've been dehumanized in their own ways. That's a different category. I, I will never reach those people. But there are some people like the folks in coal country who feel strongly that they have been left behind by the elite. And I feel like our work as those of us that have the privilege of academic culture, um, the skill sets, the practice to model how we're gonna meet those folks halfway. And I, Tim, I remember you saying to me, and it's like, I don't wanna meet white supremacists halfway either. Like I don't, but I wanna understand why they think that's a good, a good uh, worldview, why that worldview works for them. So I'm sorry, I think I'm taking us way off track, but I just have been thinking a lot about, and I'll tell you two more things. I listened to two things this weekend. One was Loretta, Loretta Ross. I'll put these in the chat if people are interested. Loretta Ross is a visiting faculty at Smith right now, and she's doing a lot of work around cancel culture. She was part of SNCC and some of the early, she was not a name that people heard about in the early um, scaf unfolding of the civil rights movement, but she talked about her early days when she was waking up to civil rights as a black woman from the South. And she sat and she said, in our black community, in our cohorts, we, there was so much infighting. We were canceling other, each other out all the time, but we couldn't let white people know that. We had to figure out how to work through that and wrestle with it ourselves. And what I would say is us white folks need to do the same thing. We need to figure out how we, we are stop, we need to stop canceling people and we need to figure out how to bring people in instead of bringing, instead of calling them out. So that's one. And then my last one, my last podcast I listened to this weekend, which was amazing, was Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice Initiative. And I was thinking, you know what, this weekend I listened to three different folks of color, one indigenous woman, two people, two black folks who were talking about love who are talking about love supreme, who are talking about how can we liberate each other so that we can create the beloved community that, that King talked about. And I'm sitting there thinking, Jesus Christ, here we got folks of color whose great grandparents were, you know, were slaves on cotton farms in the South. And they're talking to me as a white person about love. For me, that feels like, you know, I need, to, I need to take a look at what is it that I can't do if I've got people of color in my life who are trying to figure out how to wrestle with white supremacy culture. Mary, I think that's a great point. I'm sorry, Nick, why don't you go ahead? Mary, I, I think uh, back to, uh, you know, my days on the streets uh, doing things very similar to you. Um, and the first thing that I would put forward in terms of what I would do in your shoes, uh, given the, the complexity of the situation you're describing, is, is try to ask your, the folks in these settings, how, who 
can they join with to make their world a better place? Who are their allies? And, and um, by trying to identify allies, you, you get an opportunity to name a bigger group. If somebody in Lamoille County says, well, I got, you know, Fred over there in the other around the hill. But then there's, you know, and then there's the, you know, the other poor people, the other difficultly circumstanced humans that, you know, who, ha who most oftentimes have different skin color or different nationality. But enlarging the group that people can make allies with is a point of departure I always found as a counselor, teacher, organizer. So I'll, I'll uh, jump in now. Um, very interesting conversation. Appreciate your, all of your uh, insight. But I, w I wanted to, uh, to talk about something that kind of ties in with what Mary said. Is how do we find our allies in, uh, in our communities? And particularly the idea that th th these, these uh, black people were actually in fighting. Uh, but didn't want to let anybody know. And uh, my my perspective on our culture uh, is that we are in fighting too, in a, to a less lesser degree maybe, but uh, constantly competitive, constantly looking out to prove or to show or to demonstrate it, that in some way we are superior to other people. And and that attitude, which I think is pervasive in in our culture separates us all from each other and stops us all from being able to work together in a very deep and heartfelt way. Um, so that's just an observation I like to throw out there. I think we need to do some work on that. I think uh, the work of Isabel Wilkerson's, uh, um, her latest book on caste in America, C-A-S-T-E, really addresses that in terms of what, what Neil is talking about in terms of a built-in, uh, baked-in hierarchy and how caste is really the foundation for race and the race hierarchy. And it is less mutable, it is more immutable than race is, uh, according to Wilkerson's analysis. And I, I I, it was very, I thought it was very compelling. I know Nick read the book too. I think her work is very compelling mm -hmm. and, and uh, worthy of incorporation into the, our understanding of the hierarchy in terms of those divides uh, that we feel we're, we're running into. We're trying to leap over um, on a, you know, on a, got, got a daily basis. I, I just think about my, my community here you know that one third of Vermonters, as we're speaking, are food insecure. One third. That's that exceeds uh, U.S. Depression 1930s levels right now. One third. I mean, that just is so mind-boggling, and uh, it makes it usually when I when I get this when I get these these doses of information, I, I feel so inadequate. I mean, we're all going to keep fighting. That's why we're doing it. I know that. I'm not giving up. But, but I feel like you know, when I'm just a little, a little, you know, feather in the wind compared to what is what is necessary. So there. So, just be, just to come back to parliamentary versus this system, the thing that strikes me, the fundamental thing that strikes me is when you have a two-party system, you have an adversarial system. And we have a lead, the, it's run, with, people don't talk about this, but it's run by lawyers. And lawyers have an adversarial view of the world. An adversary, adversity requires win and lose. And I think the fundamental core problem that we're all dealing with is this is a win-lose situation. It's not a conciliatory uh, uh, work together to come to a resolution. Mm -hmm. It's who wins and who loses. And it's a fundamental core issue 
for this entire society. That's how it feels from the outside. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that speaks to what Mary is talking about in terms of how do you bridge that with feelings of love or respect? Right. Exactly. I mean. yeah. When you have a system where somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose, as opposed to the concept of let's form a coalition and try to process the problems and come up with an answer mm -hmm. that's mutually agreeable to a majority of people. And a, a parliamentary system demands coalition. That's exactly right. Absolutely. It won't work without a coalition. It, won't, it can't. Right? Yeah. And this yeah. system is all about who wins, who loses. In the, from the, you know, when we talk about poor people being impoverished, all that kind of junk, which is very important, they have to deal with the court system in this country without representation. I have patients who are trying to battle with the court to get custody of their child and they cannot get representation in the court. They can't afford it, and there's nobody available to represent them. And all the way up, they're basically at odds. They're alone in a system where they either win or lose. And yeah. it goes all the way through everything. And I, I just wouldn't dismiss that issue. Hmm. I would like to say that um, as a psychiatrist, Neil, um, don't you agree socialization is really difficult to alter to anybody who's over 15 and let alone 35, uh, let alone 60. Um, and so we're human beings, we're all witnessing our own socialization. And, and as we look at you know, recent history uh, or Moments. When when do human beings come together in this nation? After hurricanes, after typhoons, <laughs> they come together crisis. in emergency situations. Yeah, and we are, you know, Tim's point that you know, thirty three percent of Vermonters are, are are in food scarcity right now. You know, and again, Mary, this is when you get to them. You say, well, who can help you? Who's your allies? If 33% of Vermonters were able to join together and demonstrate the emergency they're in, we would all help. But we're, we're atomized through our socialization, through this United States miseducation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, is in many degrees, identifying the actual emergency we're in and somehow bringing us together around emergency just like the New Deal. So if only 23% of the American people were unemployed in 1932, and we got 25% unemployed right now, why was there three you know, trillion given you know, uh, in May and, 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 and nothing right now? Well, because again, people have accepted it. They've, ex you know, it's part of the socialization that we're, that we're, we're way too drenched in. So yeah. how to keep the emergency on the table. Mm. Mm. But I would also, I would also say, Nick, that's really interesting because I've been thinking and I can't recall it now, but that is part of our, that's part of the human dilemma. The fact that we only respond when we get to these kind of crisis scenarios. And so, because, you know, people with those of us, and I'm not us, but you know, folks that are benefiting from the system are not going to bring attention to the dysfunction of it because it works for them. So the systems are dehumanizing. They're set up to also disconnect us from ourselves and disconnect us from the true reality. That's how the systems are set up. But I don't think people see this. So the, what we do is, is we blame people, but we don't blame the system. We don't understand that there's... But now you know, you're in the clouds now, Mary, see? I right know. This but, is big. That's okay. We've got to move from the clouds to the ground, right? we got to... I got one foot on the ground and one foot in the clouds. Okay. So, so, anyway. so Murray Holmes that was on earlier lives in Victoria, Australia. And Melbourne, Australia had a COVID catastrophe a couple of months ago. And what happened is the in entire state shut down. And for the last 30 days, they have not had a single COVID um, uh, uh, case. 
And so if we're going to talk about catastrophes, we might want to talk about COVID as an ex example of the failure of this political system. Because essentially what's happened with COVID in this country is that the whole thing has been obfuscated, lied about, turned into a religious uh, phenomena, um, and dissipated throughout the states. And the person in charge has been playing golf. And if you want to have, if we're going to have a response to the to the to the uh, uh, hunger in Vermont, or well, we're going to have a response to the COVID in this country where we've now got 275,000 people at a low estimate dead, we need to have a functional democratic system. And we don't have it. And other systems, they're not perfect. I mean, you know, Sweden hasn't got it right, but other systems have figured out how to move the people into a process of supporting each other. Essentially, what's going on here is it's divide and conquer. And, you know, I, I'm, it's, I'm horrified by this as an Australian as, and as a physician, that we're allowing people in huge, two and a half thousand people a day to die now because some individual doesn't think this is real or doesn't think he can be bothered with it. And so, I, I mean, I kind of agree with you on many levels. But unless, I, I'm just stuck with how to change such a, um, a destructive system uh, that is causing such harm. And this, for me, exemplifies the f absolute failure of democracy in this country. And by the collective, or, or the, yeah, the, the consensus um, of individualism in this country, if you will. <laughs> It's almost a contradictory in term, contradiction in terms. But, you know, our ethos is, oh, the rugged individual, the pioneer, oh, and all of that, that mythology that is still so, in my view, and I think all our views, damaging to, collect, it, it, uh, to collective action. You know, so instead of the, the individual, how about the group? How about we bridge those divides? How about we care? There should, there should be no conversation about whether you wear a mask or not. It, should, it, just, it shouldn't even be part of a conversation. It just should happen. Why? Because we know why, and we know why it's not happening in this, in this culture, right. so, how we're socialized. You know, when Kennedy said, uh, ask not what um, your fair country, you can, what, um, country can country do, for do for you. you, what can you do for the country? That's an exceptional comment. Yeah. That should be on front and center yeah. all the time. Yeah. And it's not. What's yeah. essentially the model is what can I get? How much of it can I get? Yeah. How much can I get under the table? Yeah. Right? Me first. Me first. Yeah. 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 I, I, I just quickly, I, I know, Timmy, you and I have talked about that. I, I can't even wrap my head around it. I mean, that for me, the idea that I may not care about my, in terms of masking, right? I may not care about myself because I have a low sense of my self esteem or sense of value as a human. But even worse, I don't really care about you. Yes, right. Yes. That's the, and that for me, especially when I think about, and I, I'm very fortunate to have a teenager who, you know, keeps me in the moment. It's like, what is the message? What will the repercussions be of that kind of messaging right. around our connection to each other as human beings? Yes. Because if we don't start with that, if we don't solve that and figure out how to give attention to that, the rest of this is just, is just, it, it's just blathers. For it is. Answer. You're right. I, I totally agree with that. I think, um, it is. That's that's true, and we are we're just uh, whistling in the dark, or whatever the expression is. Yeah, I would have said pissing to windward, but I didn't want to be an L. <laughs> but I do want to say because a couple people said in here, you know, well, where was it about keeping it local, or maybe it was me. People talking about oh, maybe I don't know. Somebody said. Oh, actually, it was you, Tim. You said, well, then what does this mean? You know, I'm just a feather in the wind, and I, I know that you you only say that you know, in your worst moments of being disheartened because you've been doing this work your, most of your life. And 
you know, we all have our moments where we feel disheartened and we're not sure what's next. Um, but I do, and I feel it in my town, like living over here in Winchester, we moved here in 2000 and now it's 2020. And I can just see like little points of light where there's new people running for office. There's attention being paid to let's get rid of the, you know, the old dudes and the select board and bring in the new energy. Like that stuff is happening. And I feel like this idea of keeping it local and paying attention to what we actually can impact is also part of our humility. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because yeah. I think, you know, as white folks, particularly, we get socialized to be like, we can go out there. I mean, my father said it to me, it's like, you go out there and you change the world and, you know, you can do whatever you want. And it's like, well, I probably could because I'm white mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm educated. But the truth is, I just need to do what's within my sphere of influence and not get too carried away with what's happening. Because the truth is, we are not going to change. Even with this new administration in, the same bullshit is going to be happening. Yes, yes. So how do we think about, okay, thank God we don't have him in for four more years. What can we be doing in our... Oh, God, that made me nervous. Whatever that noise was. What? Oh, oh, Monica. Oh, it's a... No, that's my alarm. That's my. Uh, oh, it's the clock. Just, you know, just again, because we have to practice some humility around this. It's like, yeah. no, we, I mean, I'm not even sure if we can change Montpelier, but we can do what we're doing and take care of each other and take care of the 30% of people in the state who don't have a hot meal coming tomorrow morning. Yeah. 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 Right. Anyway. I feel. I feel compelled to share a story that I have sh I've shared before in the past when, when I'm talking to uh, groups of people who are concerned about democracy. And it, it's a story about this uh, anthropologist who was working with the local black people, local black communities in Africa. And one day he got this idea. You may have heard this story, but it's a, it's a wonderful story even to, to reconsider. So this anthropologist, he was working with these, with these local people. One day he got this idea and he, he got together a big basket of fruit and he brought it outside to the kids and he said, listen kids, to the group who was gathered there, here's this beautiful basket of fruit. Now I'm gonna put it over there by the tree and the first one who gets there gets all the fruit. Now, you understand? And they said, yeah, we, we understand. And he said, okay, Get ready, get set, go. And all the kids joined hands together and walked over to the basket of fruit. And he said, well, what's going on? He said, why'd you do it that way? And, he, and they said to him, which is in an African word, Ubuntu, and, and that word means I am because we are. Oh, beautiful. It's a slightly, slightly different perspective on what it means to be a human being. Yes. You could definitely use more of it. I think that the, uh, <laughs> the idea of white supremacy uh, may figure in there somewhere in terms of what happened to that conception of humanity. Uh, we'd all be a lot better off, perhaps, if we could think that way. Certainly, I can't, but I would like to. Yeah. That's a that's a, an appropriate, absolutely appropriate uh, story for what we're what we've been talking about. It puts us back in the clouds, but damn it, we have to be both on the in the clouds and on the ground. And we can we can hold those two things. They're not contradictory. We can hold those two things in our minds and our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. We need both. Thank you all for coming. I just have a. A closing uh, thing that I, I want to do to wrap up the show. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thanks everyone. It was a very interesting Zoom odyssey tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here at this Brattleboro Democracy Forum Zoom meeting. I'm very happy to say that this meeting will be aired on BCTV. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting, which uh, in theory is on January 4th, which is the first Monday of the month. So thank you all for coming and look forward Thanks. to seeing you again. Thanks, Woody. Thanks, Woody. See, you. You. See you, folks.